Good evening, boys and girls, investors, friends, family, followers from around the world. Welcome to Brain Hacking Your Way to Greatness, presented by Dr. Dean Chance, who's on the back ends of this recording. I just want to kind of give him an intro for those who uh, you know might not be intensely familiar with his overall greatness. Um, so myself and Dean have known each other for a few years now. He lives in Gainesville, Florida, and uh, has become one of my best buddies, phenomenal trading partners, just an overall incredible person. And as you all know, likely, May is Health and Wellness Month here at Real Life Trading. So for Health and Wellness Month, you probably all know that we're doing the burpee challenge. So we're trying to do five additional burpees every single day. For the entire month so by the end we'll have done 155 at the end of the month um, and as part of that we wanted to also incorporate some other health aspects into health and wellness month and this is going to be one of those additional aspects so just to make sure everyone can hear myself and uh, type in a one into the chat pane just to make sure Dean will hop on the audio in just a moment as well but I do want to thank you publicly for being here and uh, for Dean, who is a father and a brother and has a lot of things going on down there, a lot of patients, a lot of people who, uh, you know, two children. Thank you, Dean, for your time. I appreciate it. I'm really excited about tonight's information because it has absolutely nothing to do with trading, but in a way, it just might have everything to do with trading. And it comes at a perfect time where Dean had his one of his best months ever in March and in April. So my good friend, Dean, take it away, my friend. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, happy to be here, happy to be of service. And uh, yeah, hopefully we can hack our way to greatness, uh, increase those R's and uh, just be the best version of ourselves that we're trying to be. Um, so for those of you that don't know me, my name is uh, Dean Chance, and I am a doctor of chiropractic. My background for undergrad is I got my degree in exercise physiology and I've continued to study some advanced work in nutrition, neurology, and in something called neuroemotional technique. So I think the uh, the things that I've studied uh, really help uh, give me a little bit of perspective and can help teach you guys some things. And I actually used to teach uh, nutrition at um, an acupuncture college. So I've taught doctor, doctorate level of nutrition. So hopefully I can bring you guys some good information without getting you too much in the weeds of science of things. All right, so let me show you. This is actually the my results of a, of a blood test that measures a few things. It's the ratio of fats, how much inflammation is in your body. You do a brain test that measures your processing speed, attention, flexibility, memory, those sorts of factors. And what it does is tells you how likely, how quickly you're likely to age and to degenerate. So my previous one that was performed in August, you can see on the left, and then four months later on the right, you can see physiologically what a difference I was able to make, not only in my cellular inflammation, but also in my um, brain and my uh, cognition ability. So what initially led me down this rabbit hole of brain health is I had two grandmothers who suffered from Alzheimer's disease horribly. So I went into looking at what I could do to help prevent myself and my family members and my parents and people I loved and cared about from suffering similar things. So um, that's one of the things we want to keep in mind tonight is not only do we want to optimize, do we want to hack, do we want to be the best we can be, but our brain is how we live our lives. Our nervous system is how we experience our universe and our reality. And as that deteriorates, everything else falls apart. So there's a uh, concept that I use clinically every day in my office, and this is called the home run formula. So if ever you, you hear of somebody talking about holistic healthcare, this is just an easy model that helps simplify things. So I was, a, I was a baseball player in high school, so this is supposed to be a baseball bag. So in health, we wanna be as safe as each one of those bases as possible in order for things to function as well, uh, as well as they possibly can. 
So in my office, we have tools to address each one of these bases. Uh, we have physical tools in, in my office. These would be adjustments. Um, for you at home, we're going to be thinking about posture, exercise. Um, over here at first base, we've got emotions. Um, different things that you can work on include meditation, there's yoga, all kinds of wonderful things over that are stress reducing. Uh, second and third base represent the biochemical side of the equation. Um, and we're going to talk about diet, intermittent fasting, we're going to talk about supplements. Um, I'm going to tell you the things that I take personally. So one of the one of the things we really want neurologically is to get in the zone. So what is the zone? So I really think when I'm trading well, I feel like Neo and I can see through the matrix. So the zone is that point of just effortless concentration where you're just performing optimally. It's just easy. So the first topic I want to uh, tackle and demystify a little bit um, is meditation. So the definition of meditation is um, paying its, yes, boot the market maker across the room. That is my R. So meditation is paying attention in a particular way on purpose in the present moment and non-judgmentally. So for a lot of us, when we meditate, there's the monkey mind in the back of our head that's wondering, am I doing it right? Is this what I'm supposed to be doing? Why can't I do it right? And so those of you that took a second and you said, wait, what is the monkey mind? That's the voice in the head. That's the one that we're trying to let go of when we're meditating. Okay, so physically, how do we go about meditating? So there, there's a bunch of different types of meditation. There's transcendental meditation. I wanna teach you guys just a very easy one, one that I use personally. Um, and what it involves is deep breathing. And when you focus on your breath, you focus to the center of your chest and breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. So if we're gonna meditate, the ideal practice routine we wanna get into is five minutes each time we practice, three times per day. So I do not take a trade personally unless I've done a five minute session or unless I've exercised before I get into the market. Because I know if I'm not emotionally and mentally ready, then I'm gonna wanna tr just trade that first minute candle, get hyper aggressive, and then before I know it, it's two minutes into the market and I'm already down an R. So my own personal rules, I have to either exercise or do a five minute meditation before market opens and before I take a trade. So here's just a little bit more information about um, what we're doing with this particular type of meditation. When you get a little bit better and you feel like you're in the zone, then we want to take the training wheels off a little bit and try to activate a positive feeling that we try to feel um, in our heart. So I'll show you in a minute a physical tool that I use that's biofeedback that's giving me instantaneous information and telling me when I'm in that meditative zone and when I need to focus in a little bit more. So I'll also show you that app has the ability to kind of show you different things. Um, one of the things when I'm trying to do step two and activate a positive feeling is it has a little picture of my son who's three as the little baby um, on my wife's chest. So when I'm trying to take the training wheels off and activate a positive feeling, that's how I try to get there. Um, are you guys up for doing a, uh, a quick little five minute meditation with me now? Dude, I'm so down. Right, I'm, I'm totally ready. Right, for those of you who are there, would you type one if you have any history of meditation and two if you've never meditated, never meditated before in your entire life? All right. About 50-50. This is good. I like it. So for those of you who have never done it before, it's one of the most powerful things you can do. Um, people overthink it, and we're just going to do a nice, easy meditation right now. Okay, so I've got our little breath pacer. It's going to show us when to breathe in and when to breathe out. So remember, on the in-breath, we're breathing in through our nose, and on the out-breath, we're breathing out through our mouth. And 
And now as you're doing this, I want your sole concentration to be on what it feels like to breathe. So really direct your attention just to the chest. Breathe in deeply, not so deeply that it's painful. And then as you breathe out through the mouth, just allow it to relax and let go of the stress. And we're just bringing our attention to the present moment Nothing else matters. The noises that are happening are just happening. They'll go away. Paying attention to the present, what it feels like for those of you that are seated, sitting in the chair. Feet flat on the floor. Hands out, open. And if your mind has wandered, just bring it back to the breathing. Every time that monkey mind starts to think and starts to take you down that rabbit hole of thoughts, just lovingly wipe it away, bring it back to the present moment, focus just on the chest. And now let's go ahead and take the training wheels off and try to feel something that brings up the feeling of gratitude, gratitude, love, appreciation, joy, any of those kind of things, whether it's something you just love to do, being outside by the beach, or thinking about your best friend, or maybe about making 25 hours last month, whatever it is that'll get you to that point of just honest gratitude, love, appreciation. Now let's do a few more good breaths, just totally focused on the chest. Breathing in through the nose. And then out through the mouth. All right, that's it. For those of you who have never meditated before, you have now meditated. There's nothing overly complicated about it. The key is just really just focusing in on the present time. Every time your mind starts to wander and you start to think, oh, I wonder if the kids are asleep. Do I need to check on this? Did I leave the stove on? It's just bringing it back to the present moment. So that's mind training. That's meditating. Um, how do I skip to this next slide now? All right. Do you guys like that? Feel a little bit more focused, a little bit more relaxed, a little less tension going on mentally and emotionally? All right. Beautiful. All right, so personally, when I'm meditating, and you guys will learn this about me over the next hour, um, I am an analytical guy. I got to get data. I got to measure things. So for me, the hardest part of meditating was, am I doing it right? I went to uh, our former business partner, taught 
or Kung Fu, Qigong, um, those type of meditative practices. And I, for the love of God, just wished he would give me a belt. Give me a white belt, a yellow belt, a red belt, some way that I can measure progress, that I know that I'm improving. And also I'm a competitive guy. I want to know that I'm better than the average person and I want to try to be the best at whatever I'm doing. So what I really love about this particular tool, and if you guys like this tool, it's available through the Institute of Heart Math, and it's called the Inner Balance app. So I've got this on my phone. So these are just individual screenshots of me doing my meditation. So if we look over here in uh, my on the left hand side, um, and I'm just trying to figure out how do I bring up uh, a pen. Uh, mouse. Can you guys see my mouse? Oops. You guys see my mouse on the left? left yep. Right yep, I can see it. Okay, beautiful. So what this app is measuring is a really important thing called heart rate variability. And heart rate variability is a direct measurement into your autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system is the side of the nervous system that we can't consciously control. Like you can't consciously control your heart rate, secreting gastric juices, your blood pressure, all those things that happen automatically. That's the autonomic nervous system. So what the autonomic nervous system, when it's measuring your heart rate variability, what we know when you take a breath in, your sympathetic nervous system is supposed to go up a little bit. That's like the gas pedal. That's the fight or flight response. And when you breathe out, your parasympathetic nervous system is supposed to take over. That's rest, digest, repair, healing. That's the side that calms us down. So personally, when you were meditating, I don't know if you felt it, but when I meditate, when I do that out breath, that's the, that's the breath that I really like because I can just feel the tension melt away. So if we look at this sine wave looking thing right here, this is me practicing my meditation one day and I just, just took a screenshot for you guys. And what's supposed to happen on the in breath is we're supposed to go up a little bit. And when we breathe out, the heart rate is supposed to go down. So with our heart rate variability, when we're in the zone, we get this nice, pretty sine wave. And if we look up above here too, the, the app while it's measuring, um, and they have ones where you can be measuring your heart rate, your heart rate variability through fingers. And I use one that just clips onto my earlobe and it's measuring my heart rate through that. And so it'll kind of tell you when you're uh, red in kind of a stressed out state, blue when you're improving, um, and green is that zone where we want to be. So being an analytical guy, I spend a lot of time when I'm using this app on this left hand side of the screen over here just getting the raw data and then sometimes i know i'm too much in my head and i want to take the training wheels off i want to be a little bit more emotional about it and this is the picture that i've set um, for using this app of my little three-year-old when he was a baby and that really for me is really helpful to get me into that feeling of love gratitude and appreciation and I also personally set goals. So I want, like we said, ideally we want to do three five-minute sessions a day. So I try to do at least one five-minute session a day, and it measures how many, uh, like your level of coherence in this column here. So the higher the number, the better. And then the total number of points over here on the far right-hand screen. So when I do a five-minute session, I'm trying to get 300 points. So I really love this tool, and it's a way to take something that's very esoteric very much people put meditation on a pedestal of like oh only the buddha can do it in this this point of enlightenment and it brings it down to other people where we can measure it and we can measure success and we can uh, progress over time all right so there are a ton of health benefits uh, of meditation so my own um, personal pet peeve is when a doctor or somebody who's presenting their slides just sits up and reads a slide. But this slide, I don't have a whole lot to tell you guys other than what's on the slide. So all kinds of physical, mental, emotional benefits of meditation, uh, both in short and long term. So there's all kinds of reasons why to meditate. They probably already read my slide by now, hopefully. Um, so Tim Ferriss, um, 
who's a really smart guy, he says, and he's worked with world-class people all over the globe, he says 80% of all the high-level people that he works with daily practice some form of meditation um, or mindfulness practice, um, and he called it a meta skill. So meditation really is one of those things that improves everything else. And when you're meditating, you're just mind training. So if you think of exercise as trying to get stronger in your bones and muscles, meditation is getting stronger with your brain and becoming more and more uh, present in the, in the current moment in time, which will help everything that you do. So this was a study that I found that was awesome and shocked the socks off me. Um, what they did was they studied people who were smokers and they studied teaching them mindfulness versus the conventional uh, techniques of trying to get them off of smoking, which is called FFS, or Freedom of Smoking. And so the fascinating thing with this particular study is they didn't even tell the people in the mindfulness um, group to, that they couldn't smoke. The only thing that they told them is that when they were smoking, they just had to be aware and had to be focused in that present moment in time when the cigarette was in their mouth and just be curious of the experience of smoking. So you can see the results were astounding. Look at how many more people ended up quitting smoking um, compared to the freedom of smoking group. Almost 30 to 35% of people ended up uh, quitting smoking. So. Um, as traders, one of the most important things that we really have to be aware of is where we are mentally and emotionally. And Brad and Jeremy are so good at this. They, you'll hear them all the time, like, I'm not going to take a trade today because I'm emotionally compromised. So being aware when you've reached that state that you should not be trading is a key, key component, especially for beginner traders. Because once you lose one, that natural psychology is, I got to get it back. And then you start loosening your trading plan. You start loosening your rules. So uh, being uh, cognizant and being aware is super important. And I know personally, sometimes I start craving a trade. You haven't been in a trade for a couple of hours. You had a couple of ideas that worked that passed by. And you got to be aware when that uh, emotional state might try to take over and neurologically hijack you into doing something that's not so smart. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna go down the rabbit hole of research a little bit. So this is uh, what happens in the brain with meditation. So after eight weeks of meditation, there's obvious changes in the gray matter in our brain. So. From a neurology standpoint, you've probably heard the term gray matter and white matter. So when you hear gray matter, think about the outer layer of the brain where the thinking is done, the uh, communication between interneurons is done, memory, all that kind of stuff is the gray matter. And the white matter is where messages are being relayed to different areas that are further away. So the gray, gray matter is that thinking part of the brain. So what they found after eight weeks is changes in the gray matter in regions involved in learning, memory, emotional regulation, self-referential prospect uh, processing, um, as well as perspective taking. So in just eight weeks of meditation, so how, how important is that for us as human beings, for us as traders, to become better at learning, for our memory to improve, um, and for our emotional self-regulation to improve? All right, next topic I want to jump in with you guys is exercise. So I feel bad. I would have I would have done the burpee challenge if I uh, if I knew about it beforehand. So uh, if Jeremy, you can think about a way that I can get caught up without my arms falling off. Um, I do want to I do want to join the challenge. So my my background my uh, my degree from the University of Florida is in exercise physiology. So I have a particular fondness for. Uh, for the science of exercise. All right, so this is going to be a, a video that kind of, that's, that's a TED Talk. I can send you guys the link if you want to see the rest of it. But he's just basically going to highlight some of the scientific links between exercise and scholastic achievement. Improve the learner 
because it turns on the uh, attention system, it turns on the motivation system, it turns on the memory system, as well as it makes all of our little brain cells ready to, to grow and sprout. And that's the only way we learn anything. Here in California, for the past 12 years, you've tested a million children in grades five, seven, and nine every year. This is a representative graph of what it looks like. Uh, in, 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 they evaluate them on six different fitness standards. And then the, the graph shows is more and more standards are completed, that is, they achieve them. Their test scores, in this case it's math, but it's the same in language arts, their test scores go up. And this is what you see in every single year. So the more fit the child is, the better learner they are. So my purpose, my mission, is to go around the country and the world to, to tell people, look, exercise makes your brain better. It, make, it optimizes your brain's ability to learn. It, it helps with uh, regulate our, your emotions. It improves your motivation. And it's something that we have unfortunately been taking out of our schools. We need to reinvigorate our schools and get our kids out of their seats and moving. So thank you very much. All right, so this is one of the most exciting things that we're going to talk about tonight uh, called BDNF, which is Brain-Derived Neurotropic Factor. Um, and many scientists nickname BDNF a uh, miracle grow for the brain. So it's considered a biomarker, which is associated with enhanced executive function capacity. Um, it improves the function of your, your neurons, which are the brain cells. It encourages their growth and strengthens and protects them against the natural processes of cell death. So BDNF is a, a crucial biological link uh, between thought, emotions, and movement. Of aerobic exercise has been shown to increase, increase BDNF in the blood by 32%. So think about that, 32% in 20 to 40 minutes of aerobic exercise. So if nothing gets you out the door doing aerobics tomorrow, do it for the BDNF, do it for the miracle to grow for the brain. I lost my chat page. Where are you guys at? Participants? You guys there? No chat pane, huh? I don't know where it went. All right, flying blind. It's like... Uh, public speaking without being able to find the, those uh, nice eye contact from the audience and somebody who's nodding without that chat thing. That's right. That's right. Well, I'll, I'll uh, keep an eye on the chat. If anyone says anything crazy, I'll bring it up for you. All right. Sounds good. In the meantime, just text me your smiling face with two thumbs up. And I'll That's right. Just look at that every time. All right. So here's a little bit more uh, science of the, the exercise in that BDNF. So the, um, the pre prefrontal cortex, which is that area where we do all of our thinking, where our uh, personality is at, where that rational scientific brain is at, um, that dependent executive function is enhanced immediately following high intensity interval training, which a lot of people call HITS. So the results of this study uh, demonstrate, quote, that a single session of low volume, super maximal high intensity interval significantly increases prefrontal cortex dependent executive function, thereby providing additional evidence to support the powerful benefits of high intensity exercise on cognitive function. So other studies also point to HITS um, as helping people re retain vocabulary words 20% better than control subjects. So this is the slide, I guess, that Jeremy was most interested to see what I'd be talking about. Um, so the, this is a synapse. So anytime there's a neurotransmitter and two nerves are connecting to each other, it happens at a synapse. Um, so dopamine is one of those um, neurotransmitters that a lot of people have actually heard of. Um, you've probably seen 
those viral posts going around Facebook of this is what happens to your brain when you eat sugar. And this is what happens and lights up this area when you uh, have heroin. So dopamine is considered the uh, pleasure uh, hormone. It also activates the reward centers of the brain. So exercise has been shown to give us motivation by increasing the number of receptors to dopamine. So you become more sensitive to the dopamine and that in turn boosts your willpower and your focus. So one thing to be really cognizant that does the opposite is being too addicted to your phone because every time you pull out the phone and studies show that the average American does it 60 times a day, every time you do that, you're just giving yourself a little temporary hit of dopamine. And too many of us, myself included, were too addicted to that. That blows out our dopamine receptors and sugar. Sugar does the same thing. So we're going to be a little careful uh, that we're not doing too much sugar because it really has some of those uh, negative opposite effects of the benefits to exercise we've given us. All right. So one of the things we're going to talk about next is the easiest thing to do of all the things we're going to talk about today. And that's about uh, your posture. So there's a lot of studies that show significant changes in your brain, in your you, and also in your uh, hormones that happen depending on the postural position that you happen to be in in that very moment. So, um, so we're uh, we judge people non-verbally without even thinking about it. We are also affected by our own non-verbals um, through thoughts, feelings, and our own psychology. So what we really want to do when it comes to posture um, is we want to be more like on the left side where we're doing these power poses. So you think about Wonder Woman or Superman, hands on the hips, chest open nice and big. That's one of the best power poses you can do. And you're trying to take up space. You're trying to make yourself big. Um, there is a fantastic TED Talks, one of the, one of the best TED Talks out there um, by on the lines of your body language may shape who you are. Um, I believe she wrote a book called Think It Till, or Fake It Till You Become It, kind of based on that thought of fake it till you make it. And what she found is when you're faking it, you're actually changing your physiology to become that. So she says, fake it till you become it. Um, so one of the things she also talks about is holding a pen between your teeth, which forces the muscles in your mouth to smile, which in turn actually makes you feel happy. Um, and before we kind of get into the, the brief science of what she found, uh, just know, you know, when we think of testosterone, we're talking about kind of our dominance hormone, our confidence hormone. You think of Jeremy, think about, uh, when you think of testosterone, rather, think about Jeremy, big old beard, big old smile, confident, double thumbs up. Um, and then on the other side of things, the kind of the antagonist to that is cortisol. So cortisol is that stress hormone that's in the new love handles, and cortisol does a lot of things, including increasing our, uh, our blood sugar. So in this particular study, scientifically, what they did was they had people go in and take up one of these high power poses or one of the low power poses, and they did that for two minutes. And before and after, they measured their uh, testosterone. So what they found also is they offered them a chance to gamble both before and after. So the ones with high power poses were more likely to gamble. There's another uh, um, video that I love on YouTube about how um, successful people are more risk tolerant. And they went up to people on the street and they offered them a gamble where the odds were in their favor. It was something along the lines for a coin flip. And if you if you bet $10 and you lost, you lost your $10. And if you won, you won $25. Which us as traders, if somebody ever offers you that kind of odds, you take it every time. You say, sign me up. I'm going to do that coin flip till the end of time. But 
people don't do it. They're not risk tolerant at the right time. And then they regret of like, oh man, I was gonna buy Amazon when it was 70 and they regret it for the rest of their lives. So here's what happened uh, to testosterone. So testosterone in two minutes uh, went up significantly in the high power poses. So it actually went up 20% while in the low power it went down about 10%. Um, and then the cortisol, remember that's the stress hormone. So in the high power poses, it went down by a whopping 25%. And in the low power poses, the stress hormones went up 15%. So in just two minutes, posture leads to these hormonal changes that configure our brain to be assertive, confident, and comfortable, or stress react. So her conclusion, like I said, isn't fake it till you make it. It's fake it until you become it. All right, so the next topic that we're going to hit on tonight is all about diet. So hopefully you guys had parents who were as nutritionally cognizant as mine and kind of taught you that you are what you eat. So that's one of the most important things you should be teaching your kids because food is not just entertainment. It is what repairs us and becomes your future self. So a, uh, a recent Nobel Prize um, was given to Toshinori Oshimi, and he studied what's called autophagy. And autophagy is basically like our body's own recycling, and he studied it specifically in what happens with fasting. So one of the, the beautiful things that's becoming a little bit more trendy and becoming a little bit more viral and is highly, highly recommended because it's on the, on the front leading edge of science um, is fasting. So we can see on the slide all kinds of, um, all kinds of physiological benefits um, of autophagy and st we stimulate that um, through fasting. So if, if you think about physiology in general, one of the most important concepts is if you want your body to heal, to improve and to be the best that it can be, then you need to stress it, right? If you have weak muscles, you need to figure out a way to, to stress them. When you're exercising and you feel sore the next day, it's because you've caused micro tears within the belly of the muscle. We call that delayed onset muscle soreness. And you've, you've done a very minor and a very good injury into the muscles. And then the body stimulates healing, and it builds those muscles back uh, better, newer, stronger. So what happens in our body, we call it eustress, spelled with an E, and that stress, different types of physical stress, are highly, highly beneficial. So fasting is one of those eustresses where it sends the body into an, a repair mode. And the scientific term for that uh, is autophagy. I'm powerful enough to uh, to be awarded the Nobel Prize in just 2016. So uh, one of the, the leading researchers on fasting is Mark Madsen. Um, so he compares fasting, uh, so fasting for the brain is like exercise for the muscles. And it's, uh, it's a key to unlocking and producing new brain cells there's an evolutionary advantage to hunger. So if we think back a thousand years and it's been a few days since we've had anything to eat, the body's gotta find out either how to get food or figure out what is food. And the way it does that is by stimulating new neural connections, making us smarter, helping us figure out some sort of tool we can use, a way that we can trap an animal, a way that we can climb a tree to get the coconut out of it. So there's a evolutionary advantage to hunger, and it's especially uh, apparent in the brain. So uh, this slide basically is a little bit more research. It shows us that uh, elevated uh, plasma ketones, uh, and ketones are what uh, the body uses instead of sugar as a fuel source if you're burning fat instead of glucose. And what they found is that it increases the amount of uh, phospholipid production in the myelin, which is basically the insulation in that white matter 
which makes the nerves uh, more effective, more insulated, and more protective. So we're going to talk a little bit about one of my favorite uh, topics. So personally, I am keto. I do a ketogenic diet, which means uh, I am depriving my body of carbohydrates and glucose to force it to run on fat. Um, so uh, fasting is where you deprive the body of all food and then also uh, kind of force it to use fat as a fuel source. Um, and instead, in that case, instead of the fat coming from your diet, the fat that you have stored um, in your body. So they have a lot of similarities um, where, like we said, ketosis is depriving the body of glucose um, and it's got to use fat as the fuel source. Fasting is depriving the body of food and it's got to use Um, so there's a lot of uh, similarities and differences between uh, ketosis and fasting. So uh, ketosis is really more about what you eat and fasting is about when you eat. They both reduce levels of inflammation, which is the blood sugar hormone. Insulin is highly inflammatory. It's responsible for metabolic syndrome, all these kind of dietary things associated with higher cholesterol levels, higher blood sugar, higher blood pressure. Um, all sorts of the uh, kind of common things in the American, um, common American health problems that are killing about 70% of Americans. Um, so like we said, fasting does that autophagy, the, the regeneration purges the old and dying blood cells. Ketosis does something really fascinating. Uh, fascinating. If you look along the left-hand side where it says increases GABA, that's gamma albutyric acid. And what GABA is, is really the neurotransmitter that has to do with being calm and also helping us sleep. It's kind of the, the opposite of anxiety. And so one of the things that I found shocking when I first switched to a ketogenic diet, and I'm, a, I'm an introvert with a little bit of social anxiety, and what I found when I was on, when I um, started doing keto, is I would be walking down the aisles of, of the grocery store, catching eye contact with a pure stranger and just smiling at them. And that is not my previous way of being. And what it really is, is that increase of GABA, that calm and aware um, hormone. Um, so the, uh, the BHB is beta-hydroxybutyrate, which has uh, been shown to increase memory, learning, and slowing and aging. Um, ketosis also increases the number of mitochondria in your cells all over your body. So I've seen an increase, I'm a runner, so my, my, uh, my running efficiency, my race times have started to improve. Um, the mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cells. So they make energy everywhere in your body. So almost everybody, who switches over to a keto diet will say that they just have so much more energy. They're just so much more productive. Um, and that's because of the increased number of mitochondria. All right, so like we said, ketosis, ketosis and fasting. Ketosis is amazing. I highly re recommend it, but it's tough. It's a lifestyle change. You got to wrap, you got to massively change your diet where fasting is really pretty easy. You just don't eat. You don't have to shop for it. It doesn't cause you, cost you any money. Uh, if your fasting day is Wednesday and Wednesday happens to be your birthday, then you move your fasting day to Thursday. So fasting is one of the most powerful things you can do. One of the uh, things that's a little scary for most people um, until they get into it. And, and what scares people the most about fasting is they think that the hunger will just build. It'll just build and get worse and worse and worse. So anybody who's fasted will relay to you that the hunger kind of comes uh, in waves. And we have a, a, a hormone uh, that stimulates, that, that's our hunger hormone called ghrelin. And it comes in waves kind of dependent on when you would normally eat your meals. And the longer you've been fasting, those waves actually become lower and uh, weaker. So the longer that you've been fasting, the the kind of the easier it ends up becoming and you'll you know you'll still feel hungry it's an hour before dinner time you'll feel hungry and then after dinner time the hunger is just kind of uh, just passed so fasting um, is definitely scary for those of us who have not done it 
And if it's not going well, it's something you can just add, you, you can just end at any minute and grab a bite to eat. So fasting is great, and it's also just uh, it's 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 uh, very easy compared to ke compared to ketosis. So as we fast, one of the the benefits that happens is we increase uh, norepinephrine. So you can see this orange line. Our body starts to use ketones. So that's the alternate source of fuel when we're not using glucose. So we either use glucose, which is sugar, or ketones, which is fat. So when we're not eating any more food, the body starts to use the stored fat, and you can see this norepinephrine goes up. Um, and so the norepinephrine mobilizes the brain and the body for action. It increases arousal, increases alertness. When I'm fasting, I feel great. I feel tons of energy. Uh, the downside is sometimes I don't sleep because I'm just buzzing with those hormones that are just ready to get up, go, knock things off my to-do list. So that's what the that's what the norepinephrine does. Um, so we talked about ketosis being a diet where you deprive the body of glucose. So what that looks like is less than 50 grams of carbohydrates in the diet. Um, or about 5% of your calories from carbohydrates. And uh, fiber from green leafy vegetables does not count. So feel free to eat all the Brussels sprouts you want, and that's not counting towards your 5% calories. And then you're doing 20% protein and 75% fat. And that's really the, the, definite, the difference between ketosis and, say, an Atkins diet or a South Beach diet is the percentages. So an Atkins diet has a much higher percentage of uh, protein, which means less fat. But as the protein levels get higher, one potential concern is a process called gluconeogenesis, where proteins could be converted uh, into glucose. So if we're really trying to uh, pump out a lot of ketones, we don't want to get too high with our protein because the protein can be turned into carbohydrates. And then the other ways that we can kind of speed up and get into that awesome state of ketosis um, is fasting um, and exercise. Um, and there's one other thing that you guys might consider is you can actually take ketones um, as a supplement. So that's one of the things I personally do is I use uh, exogenous ketones. Um, those can be found on uh, Amazon, where you'll definitely find, even if you don't change your diet and you take exogenous ketones, is it's going to get your brain working better. It's going to help with your energy levels. Um, one of our front desk people is currently pre-med, and um, she will not go to her organic chemistry class or study organic chemistry without taking some exogenous ketones because it really does make a difference in how well um, our brain is able to function. All right, and then uh, one of the last things we're going to talk about tonight is supplements. So those exogenous ketones, those are kind of one of the things that I do personally. Um, one of the best things for the brain uh, is fish oil. Um, and if there's anybody out there who is vegetarian or vegan, what we're really talking about is the EPA and DHA. And uh, these can now be given or have, can now um, be achieved through the use of algae. So if you're a vegan or a vegetarian, um, when I say fish oil, this can also be done uh, through vegan forms. But what you're really looking for is that EPA and DHA and flaxseed oil does not work. Technically, maybe best case scenario, so flaxseed oil is an omega-3 like fish oil, maybe 10% of it can get converted, but we, what we really want um, is the EPA and the DHA. Um, so there's a bunch of science on the right side. Um, it shows that good levels are associated with lowering risks of dementia, um, slower, slowing the, the aging process of the brain, increasing the volume of the gray matter, that's the part of the brain that has to do with the memory, um, improved memory scores. Um, it's predictive of your ability to concentrate and learn in school for children. So uh, I'm sure you guys have probably 
at least heard of EPA and DHA um, if you don't know what they mean. And even, you know, you go into the grocery store, you see milk, they're adding DHA into the milk, and it really is um, one of the best things that you can be doing for your overall health, overall longevity, but especially when it comes to the brain. So I, uh, I showed at the very beginning uh, one of my blood tests. So this is uh, a test that I love doing in my office with patients. And it's a blood test. You just do a finger prick, get a little bit of blood, send it off to the lab, and they measure a few really important things. So they measure the amount of fish oil that's in your blood. And you can see on this report that it generates for the patients uh, the reason why it's scientifically bad to have low levels, you know, you can see for the EPA, DHA, stress and anxiety, ADD, ADHD, short-term memory is not as good. And then you can see as we try to optimize that, some of the reasons that it's good. So it improves the short-term memory, improved focus, improved mood, decreases anxiety. And this test also makes different recommendations. So it says uh, for me that I got to be taking one gram of fish oil per day. My initial test when I first did this uh, three to four months prior to this one, my levels were about a 3.6 right here uh, in the red zone. And so I took it for three grams and that almost got me up into the into the green optimal zone. Um, not quite. So it's it's recommending a, a 1000 or a, a gram a day. Um, and I'm still doing three grams a day because I really want to push into that optimal. Um, and then they measure your ratio of your good and bad fats, which is really key uh, to inflammation. And inflammation is really the main process of what drives Alzheimer's disease, and heart disease, pain, degenerative disc disease, joint disease, all kinds of things. Um, so I also uh, got this test run because I was having really bad shoulder pain um, that was, that was uh, keeping me from being able to play with my kids which is a huge lifestyle change for me and really something that I had to change. So what the, what the nutritionists tell us about our ratios of our good and bad fats is that in the pre-industrial world, our ratio of good and bad fats was a one-to-one, -one, a one-to-three up here in the green. The uh, Inuit Alaskans who live on whale blubber, theirs was actually one-to-four, even further over on this side but pretty much all societies were one to one, one to three, and the average American is one to 12. So these levels of inflammation are why there's so much uh, higher levels of higher cholesterol levels, heart disease, Alzheimer's disease, arthritis. So one to 12 is the average American, and when I did my previous test on this, sadly mine was one to 39, and my shoulders were so bad that even just washing under my armpits was painful. I couldn't play with my kids. I couldn't sleep at night. Um, and I did some of these dietary changes, and you can see this is my result. So I went from uh, 39 to 1 to 5 to 1 in uh, three, to nine, 3 to 9 months. 39 to 1, D? Oh, my God. So bad. It was horrible. Wow. Did you eat horrible. pretzels all day every day? That's all you ate? Uh, back then it was popcorn, man. I was, <laughs> I was addicted to cheddar popcorn. And, um, I'm, you know me, I'm a runner and I would justify carbohydrates as carb loading. And I would run and then I would go get a bagel or I'd go get pancakes. And, uh, most people who know me would say I would have less sugar than the average American. And I don't, I don't do candy bars. I don't do sodas. I don't do that kind of stuff, but I was doing carbohydrates. And once a carbohydrates in the body, it gets converted into sugar. So I was doing really high amounts of sugar. My insulin levels were too high. Um, and it was, it was the popcorn and the bagels, man. And it was just killing my shoulders. Man, gosh, gotcha. so you're just taking in too many for your body, too many carbs. Those are turning into too much sugar for you. Yeah, man, Car carbs are carbs are my enemy. They are they're my kryptonite. Now I know you're probably gonna get into this later, Ed, but uh, is that is that really for everyone? Like, does everyone work that way, or is it can it be some type of like just body types? Maybe some people process it differently. 
for carbohydrates? Yeah. Um, I think some people do um, process carbohydrates better. Certainly, um, you know, the amount of sleep that you're getting actually has a really direct role in how you process carbohydrates. Um, the pancreas produces insulin, which is a hormone. So there's a whole hormonal side of blood sugar handling. So there's genetic factors, there's stress factors, there's exercise. Um, and one of the one of the most important things to know when it comes to exercise physiology is you know we've got our aerobic exercise and our anaerobic exercise. So just as a review, the aerobic is things that you can do for a prolonged period of time. So like if I go out for a six mile run, even if I'm working pretty hard, that's aerobic. Compared to if you and I race to the stop sign, winner gets a thousand dollars. Like by the time we get to that stop sign, you can't breathe, right? You feel like you're gonna throw up. That's the that's the anaerobic. It means without oxygen. So there's different types of fuel for the the that the body wants to use depending on how you're exercising. So if you're doing those high intensity intervals so like if you're usain bolt and you're uh, doing a lot of anaerobic exercise then your body's going to better be able to deal with carbohydrates compared to if you're me and you're running six miles then the preferred source of fuel uh, is not glucose uh, it's fat and if you try to power a fat metabolism with carbohydrates it's sort of like trying to put high octane jet fuel into a Prius. It's just the wrong type of fuel for the wrong type of vehicle. Did that uh, did that answer your question okay, or did I go too far off? Nope, that was perfect. Thank you. Yeah. So I, I love this test. If you guys are interested in getting this, um, it's one of the best things that'll give you some insight into your physiology and your brain function. Um, when I first learned about this test, it made a huge difference in myself. Um, I also immediately made my parents do this test, knowing that both of my grandparents had dementia, and I don't want to allow them to go down that similar path. Um, so it makes different recommendations for each one of these factors that it tests. Um, you also do a neurocognitive test on a touchscreen device, like on a phone or an iPad and it measures your memory capacity, your sustained attention. So you guys know that I'm showing these slides just to like show off that I'm off the chart smart, right? Um, cognitive flexibility uh, and processing speed. Um, and I'm also real competitive with my wife, who's the smartest person that I know. Um, and I was able to take her down on these tests too. Um, and I, so we said that I did one and I did another one Four months later. So on the left-hand column here, uh, it says 829.17, and then the right-hand column is 12.5.17. Do you guys see on my cursor? Yeah, ma'am. Looks good. Okay, cool. So you can see uh, pre and post. So over here in this cell inflammation balance, that's my 39 to 1 going all the way up into 5 to 1. Robert Falco, those Sammies are the best. You just gotta, you gotta eat them uh, bread free so there's no carbohydrates so they don't knock me out of ketosis. You gotta, gotta wrap them in lettuce and get those keto friendly Sammies. So I personally love this brain, brain span test. Um, if you want more information, you can go on their website. It's uh, brainspan.com. If you're interested in, um, Getting the test performed in my office, we charge $109 for it. Um, if you want me to mail you one of those tests, there's my email address. Um, email me. We'll try to arrange a payment, and I will uh, ship you the test. So it's just a finger prick. Send it in the mail. It has all the instructions. You just draw a couple drops of blood. You drop it in the mail to the lab, and then we get the results like a week later. Um, and then one of the last points I wanted to hit is just personally what I do, um, especially when it comes to my vitamin and supplementation protocol. Um, so I already mentioned two of these things. I take the uh, exogenous 
oxygenous ketones. I take three grams of fish oil. There's a bunch of different types of magnesium. Magnesium threonate is my favorite when it comes to the brain. Um, and it's been shown to be exceptionally good for mental issues, especially issues like anxiety and depression. Um, and studies show a dramatic increase in both uh, short and long-term memory in those taking uh, magnesium threonate. Uh, the next most important thing to take for your brain uh, is probiotics. What they're learning more and more about our gut and the microorganisms in our gut uh, is called the microbiome, and they call that area now um, the second brain. So like I said, I'm, I'm into this stuff. It interests me to no end. The, uh, the University of Florida Medical School, so I'm in Gainesville, Florida, go Gators. The University of Florida Medical School um, was doing a research project studying the microbiome on patients who suffered from depression and uh, anxiety and schizophrenia. So just because I'm into this kind of stuff, I volunteered for the study to be a control subject, a healthy subject. So um, what they did was they studied the um, types of microorganisms that are in your gut and were able to draw a really, really strong correlation between the good and bad bacteria in your gut and mental and emotional disorders like depression, anxiety, and schizophrenia. So probiotics, one of the best things that you can be taking for your brain. Um, so you can think of probiotics like seeds, and one of the one of the things that feeds the seeds is insoluble fiber. So I'm, I'm sure you've heard nutritionists say increase your amount of fiber. So one of the reasons fiber is so good is because it feeds those probiotics. And my fa favorite type of uh, fiber is, or my type of yeah, fiber is a prebiotic inulin, which is really high in apples. So not apple juice where they're taking all the fiber away and it's just the extracted sugar, but an apple. So one of our, um, our words of wisdom that's been lost through the ages is an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Um, and in many ways, it's really, really true because those... Um, Prebiotics feed the, the probiotics. Um, and then the other thing that I personally take that's great for the brain, um, and I did some, uh, some genetic analysis that were helpful for me to figure out where I have some, um, uh, some genetic anomalies, is uh, methylated B vitamins. So when we talk about a methylated B vitamin, uh, we're talking about an activated B vitamin. So for myself, I have to take an activated B vitamin, which is called methylcobalamin. And on, on a blood test, I showed up that I was low in B12. And Jeremy can attest that there's nobody that you know that's more of a carnivore, more of a meat eater than I am. And that's where we get B12. So B12 comes from meat, but it comes in a form called cyanocobalamin. And genetically, I have an issue that makes me inefficient at being able to activate that. I can only activate it at 30% of what somebody with uh, normal genetics is able to do. So I can't activate that B12, which means I end up with problems with a neurotransmitter um, called homocysteine, which reduces the blood flow to the brain um, and is also really necessary for energy and oxygenation. So when I started taking B12, my running within, or I had been taking B12 actually, so I was taking cyanocobalamin B12 supplements, and when I figured out it was genetic and I started taking the activated B vitamin, immediately I was like, oh, this is what people are talking about when they say take B12 for energy. And my running within a month, I went from my cruising running speed being a nine minute mile uh, to an eight minute mile pretty quickly over the span of like a, a month or two. So if we're trying to take B vitamins for the brain, um, what we really want to make sure um, is that they're methylated, that they're already activated, because 40% of people are inefficient at in making that activation, and 10% of people are like me and can't hardly do it at all. So Jeremy, you'll like this, but I oftentimes uh, describe the inactive B vitamins 
uh, as cryptocurrency. So I say, if I've got a bunch of cyanocobalamin, but I can't activate it, it's like if you were to pay me for my treatment, but you were to pay me in Bitcoin. It's, it's technically has a value. There's a way to convert it. But if I can't get that conversion done, then I can't walk oh, over. Yeah, I, I, I can't get a copy if you're paying me in Bitcoin if I can't convert that. So that then, is that is genius. <laughs> that, I feel like that could be somehow tuned into the worst joke of all time. Yeah, let me let me hear it. How does it start? Well, that's what I'm saying. I, I don't know. It's, 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 it's something about <laughs> what's the difference between you know a methylated B B12 vitamin and a Bitcoin? It's like, oh, you can convert Bitcoin all the time in a store. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm really bad. I got to work on it, but it can get worse. All right, yeah. So the setup's there. It just needs a punchline. Yep. <laughs> or, or lack thereof. Uh, that's awesome. So uh, these are also good for for energy. So I t I tell people if they're having a hard time remembering what type of B12 or what type of um, uh, activated B vitamins we want. You know, if you watch Breaking Bad, you remember meth. Um, so meth for energy. So actually, for B6, the activated version is called P5P. Uh, for folic acid, it's called uh, methyl tetrahydrofolate. So there's a whole bunch of information coming about about people who have that gene called the MTHFR gene for methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase. And patients can never remember that, but it messes them up so bad uh, that they can always remember that they have the uh, mother effort gene for MTHFR. <laughs> yes. All right, man. Last slide. All right, so just a couple last uh, last things to minimum for sleep. You have got to get seven hours of sleep, um, especially when you're a trader or you have a job that involves high level neurological function. And ideally, we want to fall asleep and wake up at the same time. We want to have uh, our sleep rhythms be congruous with um, daylight and night hours. So ideally, you're supposed to go to sleep at 10 o'clock at night and sleep a minimum of seven hours. Um, it's possible to get too much sleep. I don't. I, I haven't met many people that get too much sleep, but if you get more than nine hours sleep, um, set your alarm and uh, get out of bed earlier. And there's all kinds of interesting research with sleep, um, especially trying to learn skills. So if you're a student, the worst thing that you can do before a test is pull an all-nighter. You are far better having a fresh brain that has studied less but has had time to cement the information that you have studied. Um, so anytime you're learning a skill, make sure you get sleep because that's when uh, that's when your brain processes it, remembers it, and cements it in. Um, if you're trying to learn a new skill, um, practice it before bed. So Jeremy will tell you, when, when I first started trading, I would watch videos before bed every night, and then your, your, your brain is going to practice that uh, while you're sleeping. Um, be aware um, that the, the human attention span is about 25 minutes. So as traders, you know, try to get up, get a sip of water, go out of the bath, you know, just go get up, move away from the computer every 25 minutes, even if it's just for three minutes. Um, when I was in chiropractic college, I would set alarms, and every 25 minutes, I had a forced three to five minute break. And a lot of times, that might be a good time to do your five minute meditation. Sometimes I would switch and do a physical skill where I would uh, teach myself to juggle something that would take me away um, and allow my attention span to reset so that I could go back to the books. Um, if we're trying to grow our brain, we always want to try new things. Jeremy, you're a pro at this, um, especially things that uh, you've never done before, um, things that scare you, always good things to be looking at. When I take my kids to the uh, trampoline factory, just within the last six months, I thought to myself, I've never tried to do a front flip before. Maybe that's something I should try to learn. So you should always, for your brain, um, be trying to learn new things, not just mental things, but physical things, because the mind and the body are two sides of the same coin, and if one's not working, it's going to affect the other. And then just always try to learn new skills, uh, whether it's uh, learning to play instruments, new languages, new sports, um, and then 
be cognizant of decision fatigue. Do you dry, you dry, uh, I'm just catching up on the uh, chat pane. I dry apples every fall. Do they contain the prebiotics? Yeah, it's just the fiber. So as long as you're only extracting the water and not the fiber, um, then you're still getting the probiotics. Those, those should be great, Nancy. So um, back to, to uh, decision fatigue. So we, we, um, we all know that, um, oh, how am I forgetting the name in the middle of a brain hack webinar? Um, the Apple CEO before Tim Cook. Steve Jobs. Gosh, Steve Jobs. Always wore the same clothes, right? Yeah. And Barack, Barack Obama. Always, he only had two different suits because what they knew is in life, in a day, you only have so many decisions that you can make. So as a trader, be aware of that. Um, so <laughs> whether you take it to the extreme of wearing the same clothes every day, um, for myself, when I'm trading, um, I just set a lot of alerts where I'm like, hey, I'm not even going to make a decision. I'm not going to think about it until this alert goes off and if i have a successful trade i'm just i'm just uh trailing it on five minute bars and setting off an alert and i'm not using up my decisions because we only have so many and if you can remember back to the last time that you moved houses or apartments there's that point where you just can't decide where one more thing goes where you're going to hang up one more picture and uh, as traders, we, we just have to be really, really aware of that. Um, and besides that, that's all I, uh, all I got for you. If you guys uh, have any questions, uh, Zuckerberg's always in the sweatshirt. He was, uh, he was rocking the tie when he, uh, when he testified in front of Congress. But I guess when you get Solid, when you, dude, you know, that was so much. So much information. I'm going to have to go back through some of that and listen just to hear you pronounce some of these things, man. That's incredible. <laughs> that, that was awesome. Can you throw up your uh, email again? Yeah, sure thing. So I just I so if I want to get one of those tests, um, I just email you and and you ship it to me. And then I do I ship it to you or is it like a, a aggregate office or something? Yeah, you'll send it to them. So it comes with uh, an envelope. So you you get a couple of drops of blood. It it, it has visually all the instructions it only takes two minutes to figure it out um you put it in the envelope it already has a stamp on it it's already addressed so you just put it right in your outgoing mail and it, it, it just goes okay cool uh for health and wellness month i'll challenge you guys if anyone's here watching it uh reach out to dean it's dean chance pc at yahoo.com um and i'm gonna so if i do it it probably won't be done before the end of may right more than likely. Ooh, good question. Um, if I I like to do it, send it to you tomorrow, then maybe it could be done by the end of May. Maybe. Okay. Well, I'll try to get that done as quick as I can because I'd love to know my results and figure out what I can work on and what I can always improve. Because yeah, that's that's one of the biggest. I mean, I love that takeaway. Uh, is yeah, just figure out small things that you can do to make your life better and improve your performance because that's what professionals do you know, in any field, right? If it's trading, um, you can get so much. I mean, but once you understand candles, a candle's a candle, right? It's not going to change. So it's like, okay, once you pretty much got down the, the vast majority of the basics, start improving yourself and your trading will get better. Yeah, absolutely. And I'd like to um, just challenge anybody who's out there still listening to – uh, pick at least one thing right here, right now, that we talked about in the topic today. Whether it's uh, grabbing a bottle of fish oil, whether it's meditating, whether it's doing any of the dietary things or the exercise things. So go ahead and set your intention right now of what you're going to do and start doing it tonight, start doing it tomorrow. Absolutely. Steven had a really good question. He goes, uh, do you recommend fasting for kids or what age should you start? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, yes, uh, fasting for kids is okay. I would not go more than 24 hours, and I probably wouldn't do, say, under the age of uh, seven. Um, the very first time I fasted was probably about age eight, 
um, and it was for um, a fundraiser for Oxfam where you took the money that you would have spent on food and you donated it to help feed uh, starving kids. So one of, one of the best things also about fasting is it helps kids get hungry and crave foods that they ordinarily want wouldn't want. So I remember being eight and breaking that fast. And that was probably about a, a 36 hour fast for kids. I would probably say keep it to 18 to 24 hours might be a little easier. But I remember breaking that fast and looking at a uh, vegetable soup, which I hated and thinking how great it smelled and looking at the vegetables and like, the, oh, I can't wait to dig into that salad. That's <laughs> <laughs> didn't, didn't, wait to didn't, dig in. didn't eat either of those things. So it's one of the best things you can do um, to get your kids to eat more foods. Bare minimum, cut out snacking. We've got a generation of kids who are eating nothing but pizza, mac and cheese, chicken nuggets. Because this generation of kids, it's keep them smacking. You want a yogurt? You want a juice? And they're just constantly filling them full of refined processed carbohydrates that they never really – um, get hungry. So bare minimum, if you're a little afraid of fasting with your kids, uh, cut out snacks. Um, they start whining 30 minutes before mealtime that they're hungry. Just say, that's good. Food's going to taste better. Yeah. that You know what's funny, uh, Dean? I didn't even think about that, but I, I think you're totally right. The fasting, when I did the, uh, the four-day fast, um, I, I really do think it changed my palate a lot for some of the foods I do like to crave. I mean, truly like after the four days of nothing, but nothing but water, that was the fast that I did um, last November. It was, I could not imagine eating like a hamburger or something really heavy. I really just wanted like a salad. I was craving like a, I really did crave man, just a bunch of <laughs> green leaves. And shrimp. Yeah, right? I, I wanted like a, so I got a, I got a uh, shrimp salad. So, yeah, I think you're really right. Uh, Guarco asked a question. He goes, Dr. D, how does natural sugar, like in fruit, affects on the body differently than processed sugar? Oh, man, we could, we could talk for too long about that. Um, uh, so one of the most important things to know about sugar is it's, it's both how quickly something's going to affect your blood sugar, so the glycemic index um, uh, of a food, and also the total quantity – of sugar, of, uh, of sugar that you eat. So sugar is sugar is sugar. So as far as the quantity of it goes, um, so personally being on the keto diet, I'm not allowed um, fruit because it's pretty high in carbohydrates um, and not all fruit is the same. So if you're, if you're looking up a food and seeing how good or bad is it for you on a blood sugar level, the glycemic index will tell you. So um, table sugar has a glycemic index of 75, so anything over 75 is a no-no. Um, anything over 55 is generally going to be pretty safe, so your, your apples are pretty safe, your berries, your strawberries, those kind of things are going to be pretty safe, um, and we want to stay away from like bananas and melons and, and those sorts of things. So within, within fruit, there's a huge difference whether you're thinking about um, an apple or a banana. Um, Patrick, I saw... Uh, asked a similar question about fasting, um, about water or juice. Um, I personally think a juice fast is not a great idea because we really want to use fasting to jumpstart ketosis. And what juice is, is just the extracted sugar um, out of fruit. So it's basically, you know, if you extract the sugar out of corn, we call it high fructose corn syrup. If we extract the sugar out of juice, we call it apple juice, and it's basically the same. It's just straight sugar. Might as well be drinking Coca-Cola type of sugar. Interesting, interesting. I have heard that a lot of the uh, a lot of the uh, uh, pe people who are specialists in the health field they they definitely recommend just no fruit juice. Which I if I drink anything, it's only only water or uh, hop juice. So those are the only the two things I usually drink anyway. Um, but ma'am. Great stuff. Steven says for supplements, there's so many brands, prices, I never knew what to get. Could I get specific brand supplements you use? Or do you want to email him or do you want to email Dean? Yeah, shoot, shoot, me, uh, shoot me an email. And um, for those that didn't see in the chat pane, I 
um, posted a link to a fat, uh, a fat fast that I came up with. So in this particular fast, you're actually allowed some calories. So it's way easier than the, the four day fast uh, that you did. Um, and then, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's partly about trying to get our body to crave the things that are better for us. And um, it's a beautiful thing. It took a while for me, but I know I was happy when my, bo my body started uh, craving Brussels sprouts and kind of looked at the mac and cheese and was like, eh, I really want those Brussels. <laughs> I don't know if my body will ever say that, but uh, I, will, I will continually work on getting closer and closer each and every day. Um, man, that was fantastic info. I know it's pretty late on the East Coast, 930, but for those who are here, fantastic information. Dr. Dean Chance, my friend, thank you so much for the information you presented. Again, if you guys have any questions, uh, email Dean. Um, he will be happy to answer your questions. He's on the trading floor all day for those who are trading, but it's Dean Chance, DCAIHO.com. If you do want to see this robot uh, who claims himself to be a human trade, um, you know, feel free to join the floor, ask him some questions. He was, and really still is, but one of the most ravenous students I ever had. He didn't, he didn't play the friend card. He didn't ask for special requests. He put in uh, at least 10 hours a day, every day for two and a half, three years, and uh, has the results to show for it. So, hey, Dean, thank you. For those who are still here, thank you so much for attending this webinar. I really appreciate it. If you're watching this on the recording or on YouTube, thank you for helping us enrich lives. Dean, thank you so much. Tell the family, Kristen, Emmett, and Haley, I said hello. Will do. Always a pleasure, man. All right. Everyone take care.